more about the future of political uh, uh, freedom and journalism uh, than the million words of Lord Mrs. Levinson's report. Thank you. Not only no reform needed, uh, but if anything, a backing away from uh, regulatory constraints uh, that currently exist. Uh, Steve, where do you comment on this? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my apologies for not being Chris Bryant. Um, uh, your, your loss, I'm afraid, uh, not necessarily mine, but I am better looking than it. Um, and I also apologise for not uh, being able to match me with my um, marketing strategy. Um, my, my publisher, Bloomsbury, is not quite as alert to um, the idea of promoting books to mass audiences. Um, however, <laughs> it is, uh, it, it's someone from Bloomsbury here, is that that thing? Um, it is called The Rise and Fall of Television Journalism. Uh, it's a, a brilliant book, and I'm sure it's on Ian's reading lists. Um, in, uh, in, in no good bookshops. Uh, just apart from the, the bit of personal background that Ian's given you, I want to say two more things. I've actually been teaching journalists for the last 20 years, um, around 40 a year. Thankfully, some of them are still coming. Um, also, through the British Council, I've taught journalists from former Iron Curtain countries who know a thing or two about what suppression of truth and fear of speaking out really means. I've also written for most of the POPs. Um, but most of my work has been around media policy, um, um, that book and um, advising various committees in both the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Um, one of the things the book does is to explain how a positive regulatory environment in broadcasting has sustained uh, a, a, a positive uh, information and watchdog style of journalism. Um, my final qualification before I move on, uh, and uh, this is according to Trevor and today's son, is that I'm also a third-rate zealot, uh, a badge that I, I wear with honour. Um, so I come to the Leveson debate um, with a pretty clear understanding, I think, of how in theory and in practice, genuinely unfettered journalism underpins a healthy democracy. I want to start by pointing out what I think of three fictions being propagated by the anti leveson camp. Uh, the first, um, which surprisingly we haven't heard today, although we might have trouble, is that the problem of press standards can be resolved by enforcing the criminal law. The argument here is that phone hacking, bribery, police corruption, etc. are all illegal, so if you just get the police to do their job better, properly, uh, all will be fine. Um, just so that we know what we're talking about, I want to uh, give you, remind you, if you like, of the kinds of abuses we're talking about. Here are two examples. Intrusion into private grief. Uh, Sheila Hollins, the eminent psychiatrist, crossbench peer, gave a graphic and heart-wringing description of what happened to her family for months, not days or weeks, but months after her daughter had been stabbed in the neck and paralysed. Journalists trespassing in the family garden. Journalists pretending to be visitors in the hospital waiting room. One journalist tricking her way into the house of her terminally ill mother-in-law and demanding a photo until she was removed by police. Journalists sitting outside her daughter's house for six hours a day in the hope of a sighting. Fabricated exclusives based on a few words by a neighbor. There have been countless examples of uh, other examples of callous indifference by hacks in desperate search of a scoop in direct contradiction of the PCC's code of conduct. But nothing criminal there. You might have heard of that case, but here's another one which has been a lot less well publicised with clear implications for, for free speech. You may remember David Nutt, who in 2008 was chairman of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, the so-called Drugs Tsar. On the basis of scientific evidence, he came to the controversial view that alcohol and tobacco were more harmful than ecstasy and LSD. And he objected to the reclassification of cannabis as a class B rather than a class C drug. In late 2009, he was sacked by the then Labour government. Now, his views on drugs were, of course, anathema to newspapers like The Mail and The Sun. And incidentally, 
uh, I should stress, are not opinions which I share either. So in those papers, amongst others, railed against him in their editorials and their news pages, I didn't have a problem with that. That's free speech in a democracy, that's a free press. But they didn't stop there. Within a week of his dismissal, The Sun published a double-page spread making allegations about all three of David Nutt's children. They published a photo of his youngest son taken from Facebook, saying that it showed him, apparently, smoking dope. In fact, it was a rolled up cigarette. It referred to daughters of his daughter, apparently, drinking underage when she wasn't. And, it's, and to photos of his older son prancing naked in the snow in Sweden when he had just come out of a sauna and was just doing what they do in Sweden when they come out of saunas. The following day, the Daily Mail, I've just, probably just insulted all the sweet in the room. The following day, the Daily Mail published the same story online. When the nuts objected, the Mail's defence was that it had taken the story from the Sun. The Sun finally agreed to publish a tiny letter three weeks later on page 53, written by Nut's son, putting the record straight. There was no apology from either paper, but a very clear, implicit message from the so-called free speech advocates. You come out with views we don't like, not only are we going to monster you in our columns, we're going after your children. And we can do it because we're untouchable. Vindictive, malicious, chilling, but not criminal. There are plenty of other examples of calculated bullying and intimidation. The news of the world informing Charlotte Church's mother that if she, if she didn't give them an exclusive on her attempted suicide, they would splash part two of Church's father's affair all over the front page. So her mother gave him the story, and part two appeared the following week anyway in the Sunday People. How about another front page splash? Kate McCann's intimate diaries after the disappearance of her daughter Madeline, bought by the news of the world in Portugal. She begged them not to publish it. They ignored her. Cynical, heartless, cruel, utterly indifferent to personal suffering, but not criminal. And that's why there is a clamour for proper, meaningful reform. That's the first fiction. The second is that the all-party agreement last weekend has been universally <coughs> condemned by the world's free press, who have united in horror at this casual rejection of 300 years of press freedom. What we're actually seeing is a feeding frenzy within the British press which has proved itself utterly incapable of covering this issue with any pretense of fair-mindedness. As Sir Harry Evans, one of those real pioneers of real journalism, said in his cuddling lecture two months ago, the misrepresentation of Leveson's May proposal is staggering. To portray his careful construct for statutory underpinning the state control is a gross distortion. Well, last week's hysteria took those distortions to a different level. On Friday, in a surprise, surprise, completely unreported speech in Dublin, David Putnam described the coverage as straight out of the Joseph Goebbels propaganda rule. Thanks to the internet and online journalism networks, the lies have gone, have gone global. It's a classic case, if you like, of modern day journalism. At least the Times still publishes an occasional letter of self-criticism, as one eagle-eyed correspondent to the paper put it last week, having read several editorials recently, yours included, I have the impression that the press is incapable of publishing an unbiased argument on press regulation. Quite. So the press coverage has been disingenuous, sometimes downright dishonest, and yet still the public support the proposed new system by a margin of over two to one. You may not know that because the poll was commissioned by the Sunday Times, but in a very strange omission, the Sunday Times yesterday didn't mention it. Some call that censorship, but it is on the YouGov website. The third fiction is that all that's needed is a stronger form of self-regulation. Now at this point, some of us run screaming from the room and dust down our ancient copies of the Calcutta Report. Over 20 years ago, after equally fragrant, flagrant breaches of ethical standards in the 1980s, the government set up a committee of inquiry under Sir David Calcutt. Proprietors and editors prostrated themselves before him and swore blind that they had learned their lesson. Please, they said, just allow us one more chance to get self-regulation right. A final drink, as the Minister David Mellor famously put it in the Last Chance Saloon. One of those who pleaded for the final chance 
was Rupert Murdoch. And as I said at one of the Leveson seminars, it was probably the second most humble day of his life. And so the Press Complaints Commission was born, and as absolutely, definitively, positively the very final last chance for self-regulation. And it failed catastrophically. It was manipulated by national newspaper editors, the same people who have tried, as Alan Rusbridge outlines in today's Guardian, to hijack Everson's recommendations and dilute them to suit their own purposes. It helped to produce, in the words of one tabloid hack, a feeling of invincibility in the newsroom. If we go down that route again, the combination of ferocious competition within the national newspaper market and declining circulations, exacerbated by a newsroom culture which remains tragically unapologetic of their past excesses, will absolutely guarantee yet more victims of press mistreatment. That's why the industry's own regulator, self-regulator, needs a verifier, as Brian said, to ensure that it really does what it says on the tin. If you're worried about involving Parliament, you might want to look at Finland, where a Freedom of Expression Act mandates a right of reply or correction without undue delay. Or Germany, where newspapers are required to print corrections with the same prominence as the original report. Or those Scandinavian countries, which have Acts of Parliament overseeing press ethics. These are not rampant dictatorships. Just to end, reforming press regulation is only half the battle. I think we need two further initiatives to, to cement the legacy of Leveson. First, a public interest defence which would permit almost any transgressions, even phone hacking or bribery, if they were genuinely designed to root out corruption, expose incompetence or malpractice in public office, or expose hypocrisy by public figures. But it would exclude those purely salacious stories that gratuitously invade the private lives of public figures and would protect ordinary members of the public from the gross intrusions and distortions that have become almost commonplace. Tom Stoppard, rightly hailed in my view as the poster boy for a free press, last week made a telling distinction between what he called St George journalism and jacket journalism. Stoppard has no problem with the proposed charter and underpinning as a means of eliminating what he called this delinquent form of journalism. A public interest defence would strengthen what he calls St George journalism. And the second initiative I think is necessary is on media ownership and plurality to prevent the concentration of media power which has disfigured this country's political life for over 30 years. As we witnessed the procession of former PMs confessing their obeisance to Rupert Murdoch, it became increasingly obvious that new rules are needed to promote a more plural, less concentrated media ecology. Everson dodged that one because he was probably exhausted of Parliament cut. In the end, this isn't about free speech. It's about curbing abuses of corporate power. In one of the more ludicrous interventions last week, Sir Christopher Mayer, who presided over the PCC as its chairman when phone hacking was at its peak, said, that noise that you hear is the applause of dictators around the world. What well, is wrong, again. Actually, the noise that you hear are the cries of anguish from multi-million pound enterprises screaming foul because they are finally being brought to account for the kinds of outrageous conduct which have appalled the vast majority of the British public. What we've seen is a much needed and long overdue rebalancing of the British political landscape and, in a time-honoured phrase, Dad's army, they don't like it up. <laughs> for the public, for most working journalists and for the victims of press abuse, frankly, it's about bloody time. It's a milestone in British public life, and we cannot and must not go backwards from here. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Trevor, no going back on reform, on delinquency. Do you consider yourself a delinquent? Most proudly. Um, no, there is no going back, and that's going to be the theme of what I have to say. Um, as for the word zealot, I think that um, uh, I think that Stephen probably justified that. Um, before I start, I just want to know how much of a mountain I'm going to have to climb here by asking you this question. Would you raise your hands if you think that the news of the world closed because 
It impeded a police murder inquiry and gave Millie Downer's family false hope by deleting her telephone voicemails. Do you believe that the News of the World deleted Millie Downer's voicemails and gave her family false hope? You want to give a show of hands? Who, yes, who's yes to that? Who's, who thinks that's what went on uh, with Dowler? Well, uh, it's well, a yes or no question, so clearly you do not believe that we in the news world. Well, we don't know. The first one was different than the second one. Well, you do know, that's the point. I thought you were an informed audience. Let, 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 Tre let Trevor try his <coughs> opinion poll. He's not getting any yeses. Uh, that's but a bit wrong. Is prepared to vote no? That the, the, they disbelieve that description of what happened. So we've got, we've got a, okay. few, a few no disbelieve. We'll move on here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me also speed this process up by saying that I agree with everything, of course, that uh, Nick Hume said, and I do recommend his excellent book in which he puts even more flesh on bones. Um, now, uh, what we have here is a bit of a, a, an after-the-party debate because uh, while I agree with Mick that um, uh, the less regulation the better and I think that uh, America, the land of the free, has set the uh, path that we should have all followed, which is on the First Amendment that you can say anything bar shouting fire in the crowded cinema and that, uh, if, that if in the process of doing so you offend or do something illegal, then the law of the land is fit and strong enough to cope with that. And it certainly is here in Britain, which is 29th on the League of, uh, in the um, index of censorship, uh, far behind many countries which you would assume had a far worse uh, freedom issue and record than, than Britain does. Um, the point is that. Uh, we have to applaud uh, Stitched Up, I'm sorry, Hacked Off and um, Brian Cathcart for what has been an exemplary lobbying campaign. It has been brilliant, it's been ruthless, and it has succeeded, and we are in a position where we have basically surrendered. My point today is not that I want to rehearse all the uh, woeful, outrageous transgressions by the media over recent years, but one of proportionality in how we proceed next. The uh, newspaper publishers have effectively agreed to accept on almost every level what uh, Lord Justice Leveson had to propose in his report, short of one or two things, but mainly any form of statutory underpinning. Now, it's all very well to talk about a dab of legislation or a little bit of underpinning here or there, but I'd remind you that um, health and safety became a monster after taking but a single step. And that's the sort of thing that we would be taking a risk of. Politicians don't like leaving things alone. And we've already seen evidence of this, as uh, Mick pointed out, with Jim Sheridan basically describing all the uh, uh, sketch writers who cover Parliament as parasites who should be removed. Uh, many editors are already getting threatening calls from especially during the period leading up to the uh, possible vote, um, getting calls from um, members of parliament threatening to support press legislation if we didn't take action to stop certain stories appearing. Even silly things like, for instance, foreign trips in which one Tory MP complained that it had been made to look as if he was simply taking jollies and when he summoned the managing editor to give him a dressing down and he was half an hour late, he said it's this sort of attitude that makes us want to vote for a, uh, a press law. Well, that is, um, that is not grounds for trying to license the media, to license the press at all. It's something that needs to be thought through a lot more than uh, the, uh, uh, the, the hacked off and a, virtually all of the Labour Party and most of the Liberal Democrats and quite a few Conservative members of Parliament have agreed to do. And um, I have to tell you that this is a political thing as much as it is a freedom of the press thing. Yes, there have been um, some uh, outrages by newspapers over a period of time, 
and uh, it's certainly true that we all make mistakes. People make mistakes, for instance, in the National Health Service, and uh, people die in their hundreds quite needlessly through bad treatment. Nobody's died as a result of anything newspapers have done, and uh, I know that there will be allegations by some that um, it has led to suicides or something of that sort. Well, that is a very, very subjective uh, allegation. It doesn't in any way mean that we should not be uh, being much more careful in the way we approach both newspaper stories and the people we write about and giving them the sort of redress that is fair and reasonable uh, in, a, in a period when uh, there have quite obviously been some serious cases. A sequence of gross outrages, as Brian called them. What I'm trying to say is this, that Joel or Justice Levinson did not leave a nice, clean, simple and straightforward path for us to follow. He left a, quite a lot of contradictory loose ends. He didn't specifically say that he wanted a press law, but he wanted stra statutory underpinning, which is the same thing. The idea of a royal charter being exempt from political control doesn't wash. The fact that there's some sort of safeguard that needs two-thirds of a majority in both houses is not an impossibility. Under the Tories, the Tories had more than two-thirds of the majority of the House of Lords at one point. And I think that under Tony Blair, there was a point when he could have commanded a two-thirds majority had he waged uh, the sort of campaign he was quite skillful at, at doing on occasion. So, as I say, a little bit of statutory underpinning is just the beginning. And I think that there is in place and will be put forward, uh, has been put forward, by the newspaper publishers. A lot of safeguards about access, about immediate redress, about uh, voluntary codes, and uh, life isn't like Cathcart. Uh, after, sorry, sorry, uh, Cal Cut. Cal Cut did not resonate with the public in the way that uh, Levinson and the, 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 and the, the, the Dalas did. Uh, even though the reason I asked you about the Dalla uh, case is because the News of the World did not delete the uh, Dalla voicemails. It, those were voicemails which allegedly gave them false hope when they were found to have been deleted, were removed by the phone company that operated the, uh, the phone messaging system. They were deleted automatically after 72 hours. But once an untruth has got its boots on, it's halfway around the world before the truth emerges. This is an allegation that has been made to us, but it also applies to the Guardian, which took many, many weeks to put a correction on page 34. But even today, the, the Dower test is the crucial litmus test of what was going on at Leveson. And it doesn't actually add up. There were genuine cases at the uh, Leveson inquiry who gave evidence, Chris Jeffries being one, and the McCann's being others. But the Dower test, does not, is not passed by the hacked off campaign. So, what I think is inescapable is that we've moved a long way since Levinson. We have done everything I think that could be asked of us to put our house in order. We have been brought to heel. The fact that the, uh, that the opponents of a free press want a something enshrined in law, I think is a very dangerous path, and I think it should be resisted even in this very late stage. Just to, um, I'd like to come to questions and points from uh, uh, around the room, but just to, to clarify, Trevor, what you're saying, you, you're saying that uh, in your judgment, the newspaper publishers have accepted uh, Leveson and continue to accept the intent of Leveson, uh, but that uh, you, you are forecasting, because I don't think you are you regard yourself as having an executive position at the moment, you are forecasting that they will continue to resist um, what you and they regard as statutory um, grounding in any way of this activity. So if it happens, as it appears to be, what are the, what are the newspaper publishers going to do? 
Well, all I can tell you is that they are considering the implications of everything that's been said and the charter that uh, has been proposed and uh, deciding uh, what next step to take. I wouldn't like to in any way suggest that they will walk away from it, but there is that risk. Okay, so that I think is where we are. Uh, we have um, uh, the deal done in the night. We have the uh, different activities that are taking place around other um, points of legislative activity. Uh, but we still really do not know what the end of this story is. As very, uh, one or two of the speakers referred to it, is a, an, an interesting and very long piece by Alan Rusbridger in today's Guardian, in which he sort of appeals for a bit of slow cooking at this point. Uh, but critics of that point of view would say, uh, we'll never get this dish cooked. Uh, we've been trying to cook it for 50 or 60 years. So that, the, the, the whole story is poised. A week ago, when uh, a few days ago, when it went into acceleration, knowing we had this session coming up, uh, I wondered where we would be today uh, when we found ourselves discussing it in this room. But uh, over to you. Uh, make a point, direct a question at a particular speaker, or um, however you wish to play. Right at the back. Let's. Uh, Okay, uh, the, the, uh, that's, uh, that's a real soft question, so we'll take one or two others as well, uh, rather than just hearing uh, um, Mick again say uh, he's in favour of misrule. But uh, I'm very happy to say that again. But let's take a few questions and see what the mood of the room is. Yeah. Well, I'm Norman Bonney, and listening to the discussion, it occurred to me there might be an entirely different solution. That would be something like an, an insurance business. There should be a market opportunity here for insurance um, companies to develop reputation insurance, rather like you have the insurance for driving. And this would empower potential victims uh, of press abuse much more. I suppose you might have to have uh, different levels of contribution, perhaps the ordinary citizen at a lower level, and perhaps politicians like racing drivers at a much higher level of contribution. But at least uh, some insurance scheme of that sort for reputation management or, or emergency press assistance uh, uh, when needed uh, might well be a way in which uh, both there could be business opportunities and a way of providing protection for victims against the excesses of the press. Are you aware of any, uh, anywhere where that... No, this has just come off the top of my head. This is a brilliant <laughs> idea you just had. <laughs> uh, so, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I've heard America and the uh, First Amendment mentioned, uh, so I, I wanted to clarify uh, for the First Amendment and then ask a question of Brian uh, on a point he raised on, on the corporatization of media in this country. Uh, and it was 1883, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, if you called yourself a corporation in the marketplace, you would no longer be held responsible for your actions. Uh, an artificial entity called a corporation so people would be considered a person, people. a person in law, and it could be sued, not you. So that what has since resulted from that is a corporatized media where I can hire a manager and pay him well because he can take the hit. I reap the profits, and it can go out there and say a lot of things, and and the, the victims who might be compensated under tort law. Uh, just can't break my bank. So if you mentioned this this uh, thing today called corporatized media, how similar is the case here in the, in the UK corporatization media compared to the American corporatization? So are you saying you think the English libel law is better than the American one? I'm asking to, uh, for a clarification on the UK case. I don't think he was quite making that point, but, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. So one more, and, yeah, and then we'll. Come to the panel. Quick 
question um, as to who ought to be doing this. When um, the courts stepped in uh, with um, Article 8 uh, of private life, uh, CAM and MGM, all the rest of it, it was that the courts ought not to be doing this. Uh, this should be a matter of Parliament. Now, Parliament's looking into protecting people's privacy. It was saying this isn't a matter of politicians um, because you know, they have vested interests in this. But who ought to be doing this then? Okay, let's, let's try and have a crack at some of that. Trevor, you are. I, I, I think that Mr. Body is hit upon the most important point here when we <coughs> talked about the insurance scheme. What we've discovered is that when you have laws, you get lawyers, and when you get lawyers, you get money involved. And uh, as we discovered from the insurance protection schemes, you get ambulance chasing lawyers going around saying, have you had an accident? Uh, we might be able to claim some money for you. And what we would almost certainly end up with under the system which is being proposed, in which third parties could even claim on behalf of those they regard as having been offended in some way, almost as if uh, you could say something offensive uh, and someone else can take offence on your behalf. There will be a plethora of claims by people who want to make a few bob out of the papers who have mentioned their name and in some way it can be strewed as having, construed as having damaged their reputation. Local papers in particular would be very vulnerable to this, but um, major newspapers too, especially since um, one of the proposals is that uh, people who complain have to pay nothing, nothing towards the procedures uh, uh, the person who's being complained against, the newspaper that has been being complained against, has to meet those costs and their own, even if they win. And that, I think, is just one of the many anomalies that flows through from that and the proposals that are being put before us. It, it didn't necessarily sound to me as if you were agreeing with the proposition that we should all take out insurance. That's what we'd have to do. Yes, uh, uh, think I so. Think, well, I think, you'd, as I say, you'd be opening up a can of worms. And, and, and what, I, what I'm saying is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Steve. Yeah, I did. Uh, 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 um, that last point about so-called claims farming and ambulance chasing lawyers, sorry, ambulance chasing journalists, um, which, is, which is being put around, um, I, I think it's very easy actually to find a way out of that, which is rather than having a completely free arbitration, 